Right, to turn to the main event uh, for today, uh, tonight's lecturer, Stephanie Flanders, uh, studied at Balliol College, Oxford, and at Harvard University, where she was a Kennedy Scholar. Uh, after a spell with the London Business School and the Institute for Fiscal Studies, she then joined the Financial Times as a writer and columnist. Uh, in 1997, uh, she left the Financial Times to become speechwriter and special advisor to US Treasury Secretaries, first of all, Robert Rubin, uh, and then Larry Summers uh, during the Clinton administration. And during that time, she was closely involved in the administration's management of the emerging market crises in Asia, Russia, and Latin America. Uh, she then joined the BBC in 2002 as the economics reporter on Newsnight and then became the BBC's economics editor in 2008, uh, which of course was in the early days of the financial crisis. She was named Work World's Broad Broadcast Journalist of the Year in 2006 and Political Journalist of the Year at the Women in Public Life Awards in 2007. Uh, in 2013, uh, she left the BBC to take up a post as JP Morgan Asset Management's Chief Market Strategist for the UK and Europe, uh, though she continues to write for newspapers and appear uh, on the broadcast media from time to time. Uh, well, Stephanie is known both for her intellect and for her ability to present complicated economics ideas in a fashion that's accessible to the lay person. Uh, the former governor of the Bank of England, uh, Mervyn King, put it in a nutshell when he confessed that talking to Stephanie was never less than a conversation between equals. Uh, well, the title of tonight's lecture is What Journalists Should Know About Economists and Vice Versa. So please welcome Stephanie Flanders. Thank you very much, uh, Charlie. I'm, uh, I'm impressed that so many of you are here, but I'm touched. And I know uh, I'm particularly touched by those. I know some of you have actually had to give up a lesson with your economics teacher to come here. So I really appreciate that, uh, that sacrifice. Um, it is an honor to be here, this, this wonderful room. I feel more Victorian. Uh, standing here. It's just such a lovely old space. Um, but I feel a bit like an interloper because when you look through the list of people who've given this lecture, um, I haven't won a Nobel Prize like Chris Pissarides, or not the last time I looked I haven't got one of those. Uh, I haven't become the guardian of the Treasury's conscience like Robert Choate, now office for, head of the Office for Budget Responsibility. I haven't even got round to writing a book, let alone several like Tim Harford, who talked so wonderfully about the history of macroeconomics here last year. I haven't done any of those things, but as Charlie said, I have spent most of my career, one way or another, trying to explain economics to people in different countries, in different contexts, on different sides of the public and private sector uh, divide. So I thought about, I thought I would talk about that today, um, and in particular, what I've learned in 11 years of what I learned in 11 years of covering economics for the BBC and explaining it to people at what was a pretty interesting time. So what are, what are the lessons? Well, I'm starting with a really catchy one that I would never have been able to get on the 10 o'clock news. The difference between a cycle and a trend. You see, you are going to get a bit of economics lesson. Sorry about that. Um, I wouldn't have got away with this unless I'd explained properly what it was. And actually, when you explain what it is, and when I say what I mean when I talk about telling the difference between the cycle and a trend, actually, you see it everywhere. It's about being able to tell whether something we're living through is just a phase, just a part of the normal ups and downs of the economy, or anything else for that matter, or actually something more structural, something more permanent. And the interesting thing is we seem to get it wrong both ways. In life, and certainly politicians seem to find this a problem, we seem to find it difficult to tell the difference between these two things. And we often think 
when the good times are going to carry on, uh, we've had a lot of good times, that the good times will carry on forever. And when we've had a lot of bad times, we expect them to carry on forever, where in fact they might well be just part of the ups and downs. But equally in all that time, we quite often find, looking back, we've missed a pretty fundamental change that was happening beneath the surface throughout that period. And I feel like we've had a bit of that in the last few years. This is something that many, many people, all of us, in fact, have done, mistaking the cycle for the trend. But I thought of a couple of examples to tell you about. Sir Isaac Newton, who I suspect gave the odd speech in this place, or at least would have liked to have done, and Gordon Brown. You might wonder what they could possibly have in common. Well, let me tell you about Isaac Newton first. He said once that he understood the movement of the planets, but not the madness of people. And he was saying that about the South Sea bubble, which was, as many, some of you will have known, will know, it was one of the sort of great, big, uh, early speculative bubbles that we had. When you read these wonderful histories, and if you haven't, you can read Charles Kindleberger or any of these other books talking about the history of financial crisis. It's kind of the best bit of economics. It's quite exciting, some of those uh, stories. In fact, uh, J.K. Galbraith wrote a book about uh, the great crash of 1929, talking about the dynamic of financial crisis. It's a wonderful book, but he tells a great story about going to, uh, going to an airport when it had just come out, and it was his first book, so he wanted to make sure it was there, and he asked them, he said, well, have you got the great crash of 1929? And he said, we don't have books like that at airports, sir. <laughs> um, but the books about financial crisis are often the best ones, and the great story about Isaac Newton when he made that comment about the madness of people was actually looking at people who were madly bidding up the price of the shares of the South Sea Company, which was considered to be the, the great new thing in that first era of globalization. I should mention, though, that when he had made this comment, he had actually invested in the South Sea Company. He was not only, at that point, the master of the Royal Mint, generally known as one of the cleverest people in Britain, eminent scientist. He was quite a successful investor, and he'd bought some shares, and he spotted that it was a bit of a bubble and that things were not going to carry on as well as that, and it was probably unsustainable, he got out, made what was then a very healthy profit of £7,000. If things had ended there, then we would have carried on with our feeling that he was one of the brightest people in Britain, then certainly a model of reason. But unfortunately, a few months later in 1720, he saw all his friends still making a lot of money from these shares, and he decided maybe there was something fundamentally good about this company, maybe it was going to carry on got back into the market at what turned out to be almost the top. About a month later, the thing collapsed, and he actually lost £20,000. And Kindleberger tells us he never liked to hear the word South Sea ever again as long as he lived. Um, so that tells us that even someone very clever like him can actually mistake the cycle for the trend, can think that something fundamental has happened when it hasn't. And of course, the classic uh, story that's told now about Gordon Brown and the years leading up to the financial crisis we've just seen is very much that, the Gord that Gordon Brown's government did the same thing and that he in particular had done it in his different views of how strong the economy was and whether there's something fundamentally different about the economy. He's credited or blamed for saying he'd abolished boom and bust, which sounds like a terribly hubristic thing to say. It's a little bit unfair. I'm not sure he ever said he had abolished boom and bust. And when he referred to the phrase and referred to the need to abolish it, he actually always talked about Tory boom and bust. He never said anything about Labour boom and bust, so maybe he had a bit of a get out. Um, but if you want to think about ways in which he mistook the cycle for the trend or changed, did he actually think there was a structural change in the economy? One way to think about it is how the Treasury looked at the growth rate of the UK during the years of during the 90s and looking back to the mid-80s. And they look, you look at that line, you think it's, you quite reasonably would say, well, it's going up at sort of more or less, you know, stepping back from it. There doesn't seem like there's a big change. But it, when we were actually living those years, it seemed like we, those, but the bumps, the little bumps that you can see seemed like very big bumps. And there were a few years where it seemed like the economy was able to grow faster without triggering inflation and other periods where it seemed like it was able to grow only a bit more slowly. So when the Treasury, especially during the Brown years, was looking at this and wanted to think about what the trend rate of growth was, they decided that it had been very close to its long-term average, the trend growth rate of the UK, 
the growth rate at which the potential of the economy increases at 2.55%. But when Labour came in and all of these positive changes they made to the economy happened, they decided, you know what, actually, we think the potential growth rate for those years was rather higher. We can grow faster without generating inflation. We have, in a sense, that's going to make us even richer going forward. We can afford to spend more money as a government. And towards the latter years, while well, the economy was growing a bit more slowly, but they still had a somewhat higher view of what the growth potential was of the economy. Now, I should say, a lot of the forecasts, the borrowing forecasts, were actually based on slightly more gloomy. They were quite careful about their assumptions. They didn't say, they didn't say this was definitely right, and they sort of erred on the side of caution when they were making the forecast. But it did matter that they'd made these new assumptions about the new trend in the economy, because it affected the borrowing forecast quite a lot. If you look at these, these estimates, the light blue lines are, are the various estimates for what was going to happen to borrowing. And the lesson of this is that in the first part, as the economy was getting a bit, uh, was, getting, was getting better, actually borrowing was lower than they expected. So they were too pessimistic when the world was getting better, when the economy was getting stronger. It took them a while to catch up with the reality. And actually, there were a few years where there was no borrowing at all. It's actually in our lifetime. It's the first time that a government was actually paying back a little bit of debt. I'll get back to that in a minute. But then, as the economy and as the world was getting a bit weaker, they made the opposite mistake. They were a bit too optimistic when the world was getting worse. So you see these blue lines, they're all on the other side. They were expecting things to be better than it was, that they were expecting borrowing to be lower. And in fact, borrowing kept on being a bit higher. That dark purple line showed borrowing ending up much higher than they thought. And actually, I haven't, I'm going to talk a bit later about what happened after 2007, but we know that the forecast got even more out of whack after that. So that was quite important. And that was, you might say, the mistake that Gordon Brown had made, this terrible, you hear a lot about how they were overspending. And some of that, you might say, was true because they were basing those spending assumptions on an optimistic view of what the economy could do long term, this change in the trend growth rate. Except, and I'm only going to give you one more of these charts, I promise. But if you look back to the 1982, when it wasn't Labour in power, but another lot of politicians, Actually, you see, it's a really common mistake. Too pessimistic when the world's getting better, too optimistic when the world's getting worse. So it's quite a common thing, this. It isn't just about uh, the cycle for the trend. And I think it's something Charlie, Charlie is very familiar with. It's part of another sort of general rule. The economists find it very hard to judge turns in the economy. And that's been true that's not just true of politicians, it's not just true of journalists, it's true of economists. It's not about even judging the cycle from the trend, it's also about realizing what bit of the cycle you're in. And I see it in my new world of investment. You know, people are very overconfident in, inv in their investments. They're always sure, like Isaac Newton was, that they're going to be able to see when the top of the market comes and get out just in time. People always think, it's that phrase, the devil take the hindmost. People think they'll be able to get out, and it's the devil that will get the worst bit. You know, some other silly sucker will get the worst bit of the market, but I'll get out. And of course, we know that doesn't really happen. When these, when these crises happen, when the top of the market comes, a lot of people are still in the market, and that's why you have this devastating crash. That's why Isaac Newton still lost a lot of money. But the interesting thing about that, it isn't just about politicians. And it really is, it, it happens when you think afterwards, it's absolutely obvious that we were going into a recession. So here's an example of that. And this is an example I used to use when I was back at the BBC, because when well, I was started at the BBC, because it was astonishing to me. Some of you may know that the Treasury produces every month the forecast for the UK economy, that all the sort of reputable independent forecasters, public sector, private sector, Every single month, they collate all the people who do forecasts for the UK, and they put them in a book, and then they can compare that to the Treasury 
Treasury's own forecast or the Office for Budget Responsibility. If you go and look at that book for March 2008, when we were actually were just going into recession, of the 35 forecast for the UK for that year, for 2008, not for 2009, for the year we were already in, only one forecaster, you can see right at the bottom, thought the economy might shrink. And actually, it's very unusual to have even one predict that when everybody else was predicting more or less normal growth. In the outturn, what actually happened was the economy shrank more than it has in a single year since the 1920s, minus 6%, when the average forecast had been 1.6%. Now, you might say, well, okay, no one could really tell that there was something, you know, we couldn't, couldn't predict Lehman Brothers, which actually happened four or five months later. But there was a lot going on by that point where you might have thought, as I say, with re in retrospect, you look back and you say, well, there was, a, there was some pretty big things happening in the financial sector. Okay, we hadn't, seen, we hadn't seen Lehman Brothers, but we'd had the first major bank run in the UK for over 100 years, Northern Rock people queuing outside the branches of Northern Rock to get their money. And that, you know, those of us in the BBC had done a lot of reporting around that, saying it wasn't just Northern Rock, it was a credit crunch that had happened across the financial system, partly because people and banks had lost a lot of money in the subprime housing market in the US. This was something people were talking about and saying, yes, the financial system's going to have to go through this major adjustment. They'd run up a lot of debt, and they were now going to have to work out how to deal with it. And yet, despite that, almost everyone thought, they barely thought the economy was going to be uh, touched at all by this major event in the financial crisis. So I say, you know, I'm going to talk about economics lessons for journalists, but I actually think this is something that economists have this, a lot of the same problems with, and it's not just, it's a cycle for trend, but also... Judging, judging turns. And I might add a sort of personal note, if I'm not sounding too sort of um, smug about these people getting their forecasts wrong, I got my own forecast wrong because I thought it would be a good year to have a baby. And I became BBC economics editor in April of 2008, and three months later went off and had a baby. So I was on maternity leave during what turned out to be, you know, as an economic journalist, <laughs> during what turned out to be the biggest financial crisis in at least since the 20s, probably since the 1880s. So we all, um, we all get our assumptions wrong at various points. But then I also was wrong in thinking that that was the end of my journalistic career. There was still, uh, still plenty of things to still to talk about when I came back in the beginning of 2009. The financial crisis, the, res the implications of that for the real economy were really only just um, getting going. But... All of us thought in the spring of 2008 that this wasn't necessarily going to be as big as it turned out to be. And anyone who tells you they completely predicted it, well, it probably will turn out that they've predicted it every year for the last 20 years. So eventually, they're always going to be right. What's the next exciting difference that I can tell you about? I think I've given myself a test of very, very boring things, which I then um, can try and make interesting. That's, maybe that's the job of an economics editor, full stop, at the BBC. Um, this one, I said the last one was something that everybody gets wrong. Actually, this is something that if you're an economist, if you, really, if you have a decent economics teacher, you should not make this mistake after about week three. There really is a very important difference here between a stock and a flow, which economists are taught, and unfortunately most of the rest of the world just never quite get their head around. And I used to find it with senior newscasters, very, very clever people, let alone politicians just not getting the difference between a stock and a flow. I know I don't have to tell you, but here's an example. Debt is a stock. It's the accumulated stock of all the money that you've borrowed at various points at very previous times. And if you pay some back, then it goes down. But if you're borrowing on a regular basis, you're building up a stock of debt. Nick Clegg didn't understand that when he talked about the debt plan of the government. Well, maybe he did. I'd like to think he must not understand it, otherwise it was a very disingenuous statement. He talked about setting out a plan to wipe the slate clean to rid people of the dead weight of debt that has been built up over time. Well, they're doing quite a lot of things with their budget program, but they're not wiping 
the slate clean, as you can see with that chart. He said that, by the way, several years ago. And lest you think I'm being unfair to the coalition, that David Cameron said the same thing. We're paying down Britain's debts. They're not. And it was an interesting thing that he was sort of allowed to make this mistake that so many people misunderstand stocks and flows that people hardly noticed. And in fact, it took, you'll see here on the right-hand side of this, Andrew Dilnot, my former colleague from the Institute for Fiscal Studies, now head of the UK Statistics Authority, having to remind, I think he sent several letters on this theme over the last few years, but this is a letter where he was reminding, admitting and sort of confirming to the Labour Chief Secretary of the Treasury that yes, indeed, um, the Prime Minister had misspoken when he said last month, let alone the previous times in the last few years, last month that the government was getting down, I'm trying to see what the phrase, paying down its debts. Had to, wrote, wrote a nice letter, I don't know if he closed this chart, pointing out that net debt had not really in any strict sense uh, gone down. And you might think, well, maybe it was sort of a bit unfair that he was talking about as a share of GDP, because we know, we know we should worry more about how big the debt is relative to the size of the economy, not necessarily in absolute terms. And sometimes I get cross when journalists say, well, our debt has reached a trillion pounds without any sense of how big that is relative to the economy. But even as a share of the economy, you can see from this chart that the years from since 2010 and the uh, arrival of this government, you wouldn't immediately notice the difference in terms of a fall in the amount of debt over that period between uh, 2010 and, and 12. So this is something that happens a lot, and it really does matter. And I feel like I can say this because I did start at the beginning being rude about Gordon Brown. It's not a party political point, but I did observe at, in my old job and I thought it did, have a, it, was some, it did seem to be a little bit disingenuous that the coalition used to constantly speak in terms of reducing the deficit by a third. And depending on what your standards are, reducing a deficit by a third, not necessarily that impressive. It depends how you're measuring it. But you know, if you're supposed to be getting rid of borrowing altogether, reducing deficit by a third, you wouldn't think necessarily you would brag about it consistently, especially several years into your government when you were supposed to be getting rid of it. But I realized over time that he must be repeating that because probably when pe he knew that when people listen, they would think he was saying reduce the debt by a third. And that really would be impressive, and no government has ever managed to do that in a single administration or even two administrations. And I can't, I have no idea whether this is true. It may be just a genuinely, they felt that the third, a third reduction in the deficit was impressive. Fortunately, they're no longer able to say that. But I think, I, I worry that, that it was trading on a misunderstanding between a stock and a flow, which people who learn economics, at least, I think, I hope, you're inoculated against that um, very important mistake. So I've talked about telling the difference between a cycle and a trend and a stock and a flow. And I think you know, both of those come together in thinking about where the economy is. They help you get perspective. And another thing I find myself doing as an economist, which relates to all these rather sort of bland phrases often, is focusing on the rate of change in an economy. And that's partly what we've been talking about, sort of rates of change versus level. And I think it sometimes is the rate of change that matters in an economy. When you're talking about where you're headed, it's actually often more important than the overall level. And I often find myself when I'm talking to investors or when I'm talking to just ordinary people, uh, you say, well, OK, we, you may have your different views, but you know, what happened in the last few months? H how fast are things changing? What direction are they changing in? Because usually that's the best guide to what's going to happen in the future. It's not infallible, as we found out with the the forecasters in 2008, just looking at what's happened in the last few months, isn't always going to get you to the right place. But it's probably the best place uh, to start. So you look at this chart of GDP. And actually, I could do it for in, var in various ways. It's not just that it's written in absolute terms. And you'd say, we're doing pretty well. And indeed, a lot of people have thought we have been doing very well over the last 
year and a half or so. Things have really looked up with the economy. In fact, the one thing I regret about not being in my old job is that I, don't have, I didn't have so much of this good news to tell people when I went on the 10 o'clock news or, or the radio. And there's been a lot of news about the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, consistently raising the UK's growth forecast even when they're cutting the forecast for other countries. So this has been, it's been a strong year for the UK and I think we'll carry on having quite rapid growth in the UK over the next year or so and probably better than, certainly better than most countries in other parts of Europe. But often more important than just knowing how fast you're going in a different place, if you actually want to know how you're doing and have some perspective about what's happened, well, you do need to know about the level. And if you look at the level, if you step back and look at the level of our GDP relative to where we might have expected to be in any kind of normal cycle, well, this has been the slowest. It's still the slowest recovery on record. It's been the worst five or six years for the UK on record. This line, this terribly exciting line that I showed you earlier, if you take that line, you can take it almost back, you can take it back 100 years almost if you had the data. You can certainly take it back 70 or 80 years. And we've more or less grown at this roughly, this sort of 2%, a bit actually a bit more than 2% growth rate over that period. And that's one reason why you might have hesitated to change your estimate of the long-term trend growth rate because it seems to be quite a fixed part of our economy. Two and a bit percent a year is what we've grown going back a long time. And what that line tells you is that, yes, if you zeroed in on those, some of those bumps, you'd find they, it was very bumpy and we had lots of booms and busts, Tory booms, Labour booms, and lots of busts. But we always got back to that trend line in the past. So we've always had downturns and then recoveries and you grow faster in recovery, you go above trend, above your long-term average growth rate to get back to that line. Always, always, always until the last few years. And that's what I mean when I say, you know, if you get some perspective on this time, it has been the slowest, recover slowest recovery on record and our economy still seems pretty small relative to where it might be. There's two things here. There's where we are relative to where we were when we first went into a recession, and we're bigger now than we were. Our economy has finally exceeded what it was at the beginning of 2008 when people were getting those forecasts wrong. But we're well below. We're at least 15% of GDP smaller. Our wealth is 15% lower than it would be if we just managed to get back to that trend. Now, this is something... There's a huge debate about this. And many of you will know this. We've had this sort of, you know, lots, lots of conversation about what's, what's driving this. But um, we do know, and in fact, you know, Kartik's winning essay was about whether or not there's something permanent going on here. Whether we're looking at sort of secular stagnation, that we're on a permanently lower growth path. And I think there has to be something there. There has to be a story, and maybe even questions. We can talk a bit more about what we think might be going on with the economy, but given what I said before about mistaking the cycle for the trend, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous of going down that route and saying, well, this is, this is something we've never seen before, this is a permanent change. And I think at least if we're going to assume that we're never going to get that 15% back, that that capacity is lost forever, whether it's as economists or as journalists, I think we should sort of at least know how strong that assumption is. And again, that's what, as, an, as economists, that's what you learn to do, is have some sense about whether something is a sensible assumption or actually quite a strong assumption. And it's quite a strong assumption, I think, to just assume away most of that growth. Because you're basically saying that this crisis, for some reason, or something that's going on with the world at the moment, is doing more damage to our productive capacity, to our capacity to add to our wealth as a country, than... World War I, World War II, the Great Depression, the big rise in oil prices in the 70s, or any of these other things that we did always manage to get back from. We had all those terrible crises, and we somehow always got back to that trend line. So we just need to be sure we know that something that fundamental has happened. Though I have to say, we've got a bit of evidence that it's not just us, and maybe that makes us realize that it is something deeper. This is 
an equivalent chart for the, all the developed countries. And you can see it's a similar issue. It's not quite as extreme as in the case of the UK. But you can see there's a pre-2008 trend, whatever governments decided that trend was, if you just take the long-run trend, and then where we are now in the rich economies and the advanced economies. And that potential line shows how pessimistic, in a sense, the opposite of what we saw in the 90s under Gordon Brown, how pessimistic economists have gotten about how much of that we're going to get back, that lost potential. People are basically assuming that a lot of that growth is gone for a good, that we're just on a permanently lower path. And as I said, that may be completely true, maybe, maybe a completely justified reaction to what are some pretty compelling numbers around the world. But it's, it's, a, fundamental, it's a very strong assumption. It's, it's making an assumption that the world has, has really changed. And it's interesting, another bit of evidence, if you like, that something has fundamentally changed, is if you look one more time, but slightly different chart this time, at what's happening to the mistakes that we're making now under Robert Choate in our borrowing forecasts. Although we've now got this independent Office for Budget Responsibility, they're still making mistakes, just like the politicians did, but they're making slightly different kinds of mistakes. And the mistakes they've made in the last few years are actually quite interesting because they're the opposite of the ones we had before. Remember the standard error before was that when you're making forecasts about borrowing, and they're particularly hard to do because you're, you're taking lots of big numbers and then borrowing is just a gap between them. So it's the gap between how much you've got in taxes and how much you've got coming back in in spending. So you, if, you, if you're a bit wrong on both of those, you could be very wrong about your borrowing. But if you look back and you remember what we were saying before, borrowing forecasts tend to not be very slow to catch up to good news and slow to catch up to bad news as well. So in the past, we've tended to get, we've been too uh, pessimistic when the, when the economy was actually doing well and too gloomy uh, when the economy was doing, uh, no, <laughs> too optimistic when the economy's doing badly. What's actually happened this time, if you look at some of those lines, in 2009 to 11, they actually were too pessimistic on borrowing, despite the, despite the economy being a lot worse. So borrowing actually came in lower than they thought, was better than they thought, even though the economy was much, much worse than they thought. So that's the opposite mistake than you would normally have. It was a bit curious. It was actually to do with, if Robert would choke were here, he'd go into the details of it. It was actually to do with the fact that the bits they'd got madly wrong, hugely wrong, in terms of how much the economy was going to grow, were the bits of the economy that actually don't produce much taxes for and or, or cost very much the government. So it didn't make such a difference to the borrowing side. And then we've had the opposite problem the last few years. All this wonderful growth we've had, normally that would mean borrowing forecasts suddenly start to be wrong on the other side. We finally get announcements from, from George Osborne or whoever's the chancellor saying, you know what, borrowing's going to be lower than we thought. And I even remember those times, you know, back in the early, back in the late 90s when that happened. We've had the opposite. Now, why is that? Why is it that we've had, ended up being too optimistic on borrowing despite the economy doing a lot better? Well, it does seem like there's something structural that's happened this time with the nature of the recovery there's a lot more employment for a given amount of output. That's reduced our productivity, our output per head. But it's given a lot more people jobs, and that's a good thing. Fortunately, though, spreading that same amount of work across more people, especially when they're cutting taxes cutting and increasing the allowances for people, actually means for any given job or any given amount of employment, the Treasury is getting less money for it and also getting less uh, from corporate profits. So there is something, this has been, although I don't want to fall foul of the cycle for the trend problem, there has been something a bit different about this time. I'm going to throw one more lesson before I get into what lessons that uh, journalists can teach economists. That's between a gift and a loan, or another way of thinking about it, it's an asset and a liability. When on earth if you're not doing account, accounting, when does this matter? Well, it gets back a bit to that stock and a flow difference. But this is when I felt we were missing the story a little bit, or at least misrepresenting the story in talking about the Eurozone crisis. It was because we were sort of giving the impression that loans were gifts. And I think in that sense, also giving a misleading idea of 
when the Eurozone crisis might be over. If you know about the Eurozone crisis that we've had in the last few years, you'll know, you've probably noticed mainly the bailouts. Certainly in terms of my coverage and the sort of experience of journalists, the Eurozone crisis was all about a bailout for this. We had a big bailout almost the same time as the election in 2010 for, for the IMF, for, for, for Greece, bailouts for Ireland, for Portugal. And I had this awful feeling after I left the BBC that people had been watching these accounts thinking that they were handouts. And people would ask me, say, why are we giving money to Greece? Why are we giving money to Ireland when they're really, they're quite well off? Why are we giving them money? Well, the truth was we weren't giving them money. We were lending them money, and that might have been quite helpful for them in getting out of that immediate bind, but it doesn't solve their real problem, which is the fact that they have too much debt. In fact, it's adding to their long-term problem of having too much debt. This is what debt levels have done across various countries, but particularly the crisis economies in Europe over the last few years. You don't see a lot of easing up, and it's hard to spot the sort of handouts there. Because even the bailouts have actually been adding to their debt. Now, it's a bit cheaper, the debt. It's better for them in many ways than the debt they had built up to the private sector. But there were two things that were sort of worrying about these bailouts, or misleading about these bailouts. One was that it was actually still adding to their debt. It wasn't actually getting rid of the problem. The other was it was actually, in a sense not just bailing out the governments, but also bailing out the people who'd lent to the governments. The private institutions, the banks, that had lent to these governments and allowed them to start to run up all this debt. And it wasn't just governments, it was also the private sector in these countries. They were worried that they now couldn't pay it back, which is where you had the crisis come from, that people were starting to worry whether Spain or Portugal was good for all this debt. By lending them money, by letting them carry on, lending them money in order to pay back these private creditors, in a sense, it was the creditors, it was those banks or those other institutions, those investors that were being bailed out, not, not the governments. Now, I don't, I don't think there's any deception here, I'm not saying there is, but I think it goes to the heart of the Eurozone crisis that these governments were actually facing some pretty bad options. And... None of those options was just taking in a free gift from anybody. They had to choose to actually take on some more debt in order to avoid having to renege on the debts they already had or do anything more dramatic like leave the euro. And certainly no one else in the eurozone wanted them to take that more dramatic course. And they, didn't really, they were worried about the consequences of reneging on their debt. So they took this sort of third best Option. And I think it's, it's helped prevent a breakup of the Eurozone. It's prevented a horrible, messy default on those debts for those countries. But it has also ensured, as you can see from here, that those countries will have debt problems for a long time to come. And it really is going to be a long time if they continue to have the slow growth that we've seen and very low inflation that we've seen in those countries. You know, they've got the problems that we have, but then a much more extreme version. They, look, they don't look like they're going to grow more than... 1% a year, if that, over the next few years. And that makes it very hard to make a dent on their debt. So what about the lessons for economists? Well, in a sense, I feel that all of the above is lessons for economists as well. I don't think these are mistakes that, apart from stock and the flow, which I really hope economists in general wouldn't make, but by and large, these are mistakes that economists can make as well. But what else do I think sometimes I'd like to remind economists of? Well, being clear is just as important as being right. And being both of those things, I certainly found, can be very, very tricky. You can be clear but not be telling the whole story, or you can tell the whole story but not really be very clear. I found it quite hard to do both. And I'll give you an example where I fear I didn't actually uh, succeed. Quantitative easing, Charlie, thanks a lot for quantitative easing. Um, I had no idea when I was doing A-level economics and thinking about monetary theory that I would have to explain this, I would say God awful, but I won't, this terrible, uh, terribly complicated process to six million people on the 10 o'clock news. And you'll see I found that my video results, I'm not going to play all of them, you'll be glad to know, but 
there were various iterations, and this was just me. I mean, everybody around, media organizations around the UK and elsewhere, and you've probably been in, had various ones inflicted on you by your, by your tutors. We've all had a stab at it. I had about three stabs at it, trying to explain quantitative easing. For many people at the BBC, saying quantitative easing was bad enough, <laughs> let alone trying to explain it. And we had various sort of cartoons. I was quite pleased in the early years, that I, in the early months that I came up with the idea. You know those pen, the penny, push penny machines that you end up spending a load of money on and you think it's just 2p, but you're putting the 2p's in your push. I thought that was a good way of explaining that you were trying to get more money into the economy and then we had different cartoons. So here's one effort. This is the one that everyone liked, but I have to say I looked at it recently and I thought, God, I'm not sure I would understand that if I was just looking at that and nothing else. Of course, I'll probably find I can't. I'm trying to get the... Uh... Oh, I see. Where's the... Um... I can't get the... Uh... There we go. understand it, but I'm not sure, and I don't think, Charlie, it was entirely my fault that it was hard to explain, uh, not least because the explanations of what it was supposed to do and how it was supposed to do it did change a little bit over the, uh, the years in which quantitative easing has been implemented. I mean, it goes to a sort of a broader point for me about that point about being sort of simple and being, uh, being clear and as well as being right. You know, it was part of the problem was that it was complex and it was an, uh, in some, to some extent untested way of changing the amount of credit in the economy and changing the demand in the economy. And the fact that people like Charlie and others were changing the way they described it to journalists like me, I think suggested that even they were sort of trying out different avenues and seeing which of the channels was actually more effective. I get particularly nervous when I see that with, with Charlie here because I, also, I made in that, uh, the beginning of that, I say the central bank creates money as only a central bank can, which is technically true because the way you create money on quantitative easing is a way that only a central bank can create money. But it was, it was pointed out to me very quickly that I was giving the impression that all money was only created by a central bank, whereas, of course, you all know, learning about the money multiplier, that a lot of money is created by private banks. So I'm, even there, I wasn't completely comfortable with that particular uh, demonstration. But for me, there's also another lesson, which is sometimes things are complicated because they really are complicated, but other times things are complicated because we're not quite sure about them. And to be suspicious of the things that somehow are just very hard to explain simply is no bad thing. In fact, going into the financial crisis, if some of the people in banks who didn't really understand some of the instruments and some of the deals they were doing had questioned a bit more, why is it that this can't really be explained to me? Well, we might have, uh, we might have found that things uh, went a little bit better and not quite the same mistakes were made. Oh, I need to get back into the... Ugh, I don't know who that is. <laughs> Somebody else tried to explain quantitative easing. He's probably going to do a better job. I should listen to what he says. Groupthink. That goes back to what I was saying about, you know, if people, you've probably, some of you have heard about behavioral economics. One of the things that happens, that people are all thinking the same way and then they're nervous of saying something that's different from other people. And you've probably heard there's lots of, lots of demonstrations of this when they do um, 
experiments with students and others, and if you have everybody saying the same thing, even if it's obviously wrong, it's amazing the number of people who go along with that. Uh, and we have that in spades in economics. We had it in the financial system with people all not really wanting to say, well, I don't understand this, or not wanting to question the assumptions that were being made about the way the financial system was working. And as we saw, as a, a former colleague of Charlie's actually pointed out in the last week, it was also true of the Monetary Policy Committee in the Bank of England. He, Andy Haldane, still very senior at the bank and one of the most sort of, you know, interesting thinkers there at the moment, just look back at the minutes for the Monetary Policy Committee meetings throughout the lead up to the financial crisis and looked at how many times the MPC had discussed banking or discussed anything to do with banks, the fact that maybe debt was running, being run up very dramatically and maybe we should worry about it. And the answer was not very much until Northern Rock. There was really very little mention of banking. And this was at a time when the banking system as a share of the economy was growing very dramatically and where a lot of debt was being built up in the financial system. But I think from talking to people who were in the committee at that time, there was a sort of nervousness about talking about it. There'd been a long experience, some of you will have learned about monetarism in the 80s where people were sort of obsessed with the numbers to do with bank lending and uh, what was going on in the financial system. And because monetarism had sort of been discredited, the people who might have wondered, well, hang, hang on, we've got all this debt building up in the financial system, were sort of nervous of mentioning that. They knew this was a brave new time for the financial system and people could be trusted to look after their own interests. And in fact, as all of that was happening, it did in the end have big consequences for us that maybe if the MPC had been thinking more widely around the subject, maybe not subject to groupthink, would have caught earlier. Who could know? All of these things are very easily said in retrospect. Another fact that I found often when I was trying to get people in the real world to confirm the economic things that were happening in the world where we have average wages going up or the retail price index doing this, that and the other or consumer prices, it can be very hard for people, very hard to get people to say, yes, that's my experience. There's so many things going on behind the average that the average only ever tells a small part of the story. And in fact, some of the best stories are sometimes hiding behind those averages and those medians, particularly when you're talking about things like income inequality. You just can't, you can't get, get very far just talking about what's happening to incomes on average. You can't get very far even talking about what's happening to the median, to people in the middle of the income distribution. You need to go deeper than that. I think the other thing that I felt sometimes I had to explain to economists was that politicians aren't stupid. Well, not usually. And they are, though, constrained. You know, when you do an economic equation, sometimes it's subject to constraints. And economists get very frustrated with politicians often, particularly in the Eurozone, I found this. Economists would get very frustrated with politicians just ignoring the laws of economics, law of arithmetic. Many people will cross with the way the whole of the Eurozone was designed, saying that was ignoring the basic rules of economics. It said if you're in, if you're in trouble in a, in a currency union, if you, start, if you run up too much debt, as any individual sovereign government was going to be able to do in a single currency area, there are only three things you can do. The laws of arithmetic, the laws of logic. So there's only three things you can do to get yourself out of a debt problem. You can get out of the single currency, devalue your currency, like we've often done in the past, make, a lot, make the debt that you have cheaper and easier to pay back, in a sense inflated away. You can get a bailout from other members of the single currency, or you can renege on the debt. There are really only those three options. Those were the laws of economics and arithmetic, which when, these, when it was explained to people at the beginning of the Eurozone crisis, which of those are you going to have? You know, you've got 17 countries now, or it was the smaller number, but you could have a large number of countries in the single currency area. If they get into trouble, which of those three options are they going to have? And the answer given by the politicians at that time was, well, we don't want any of those things, so we're just not going to let, we're not going to have countries get into trouble. We're just not going to have any accidents. And then we won't have to worry about any of those things. Now, this quite understandably caused a lot of frustration among economists 
and they feel a lot of these chickens have come back to roost now. Countries did get into, too much, into trouble. They ran up too much debt, and there really were only three options. So they had to decide, the Eurozone, whether they were going to allow countries to leave, which they said they really didn't want, countries to renege on their debt, which they really didn't want, although in the end they let Greece do it, or have bailouts, which is what they did, and takes us back to our previous discussion. So you can see why people, economists, would get frustrated with politicians, because they do often seem to ignore the laws of economics. But you know what? Economists often ignore the laws of politics as well. We tend to look at these politicians and we say, why on earth are they ignoring these basic things? When actually there were political forces, political ra realities that made the Eurozone the way it is, made it impossible for Germany or other countries to react in ways that economists might have liked. A lot of economists' favorite solution to the Eurozone crisis is to have Germany leave. It's very neat, looks very sensible, except when you actually think about it in practice, what the political implications of that would be. And I do worry often that economists, you know, you can learn a lot of things that are really valuable, but don't uh, learn to think all politicians are stupid or indeed evil. Journalists often fall into the latter camp of just thinking they're always trying to pull the wool over people's eyes. I don't think that's true either, despite some of the things I've said. And I think we can all, uh, we all often make a lot of the same mistakes that we accuse politicians of making. And indeed, those silly politicians are not the only ones who get this wrong, who mistake the cycle from the trend. And if we need any reminder of that, if anybody should give us a bit of humility in thinking about whether we can avoid all of these mistakes I've talked about, well, we should go back to Sir Isaac Newton. So if the person who discovered the laws of gravity could forget that what goes up also has to come down, then that should be food for thought for all of us. Thank you very much. So now you've got to come up with your, uh, with your questions, and you're not allowed to make any of the mistakes I've just talked about. We've also got supposedly people online who've been uh, listening to this. Uh, hi. Uh, you talk about the problem of group thing. Uh, do you think that's a problem we can uh, combat or something that will happen naturally uh, and that we can't really solve? You know, I don't, I don't think you can... It's like all these things. They're, um, they're sort of proven characteristics of human nature. So at some level, you can't ever get rid of it. But I think that one theory, at least, is that once you can recognize it, then at least you know to look out for it and you know to be trying to offset it. I mean, I suspect uh, you're never going to completely offset it. But if you know that you're susceptible to that, then you can think of ways where you're trying to sort of open yourself up to other influences. So I know, you know the Bank of England have thought about that. How can they sort of force themselves to be thinking about different things. We used to have uh, a lot of conversations about that in the BBC. We were constantly worrying, I think, rightly, about whether or not we were only representing a sort of mainstream set of opinions. And there's an interesting challenge there, because we're supposed to be giving a, the full spectrum. At the BBC, we were supposed to be giving the, you know, the full spectrum of ideas and thinking about subjects, and I was, you know, at pain of death, was not allowed to say anything that sounded like it was on one side or the other. Uh, on the other hand, in a, in a two-minute piece for the 10 o'clock news, you can't possibly represent all the different views on the financial crisis or on any given thing. You, so you're, you're sort of stuck with presenting, you know, this is the Labour view or this is the Conservative view. So we, we, we sort of grapple with that all the time, but you find ways to get different voices heard. Uh, and I think that's what everyone has. That's why we, people are grappling now with 
getting different kinds of people on, um, as magistrates, so you don't just have one kind of person as a magistrate, getting different kinds of people on, on boards for companies. Um, and I think it's, even, it's going beyond just, you know, we need a woman. It has to be, you know, you, they're looking for people of different backgrounds. And those companies, interestingly, tend to do better. So maybe that will be a natural impulse that will keep, that will try and offset this. But you've got, it's constant vigilance is the answer. Is there any, uh huh, up here? It's on there. Um, hi there, you mentioned uh, not wanting to be party political <laughs> at one stage. Uh, I was just wondering, given how often economic policy and uh, politics overlap, uh, was that a big challenge when you were at the BBC? How did you overcome it? Is it ever also necessary to be political, to explain the politics behind, say, uh, austerity and other policies? Another quick thing. Uh, While you have me. Uh, as an economics teacher, I just like uh, to point out that uh, a lot of schools will cover microeconomics in their first term and start on macro <laughs> in January and therefore won't have covered stocks versus flows. I was hoping you could bail me out. All right, fair enough, quickly. fair enough. Yes, so the, um, so the question, well, there's two questions. The first question was about, uh, in my old job at the BBC, not being party political, and was that difficult? And then uh, sometimes did I feel maybe needed to be political and ex explaining at least the politics behind things. And then the, the other question was a somewhat defensive question about which I was apologised for because I should have familiarised myself with the syllabus. But of course, by week three, you might easily not have done the stock and flow, absolutely. But maybe the idea of a sort of stock versus a flow uh, might have crept into idle conversation with your economics teacher by that point. I, I think the basic thing that it's a, that's a fundamental thing that you learn in economics still stands, but maybe not week three. Uh, on, the, on the political thing, I, did, I used to say it was the hardest part of my job and I suspect that's why people sometimes sort of, it conf when I said that, people, it confirmed the people who thought I was secretly very left-wing or secretly very right-wing. I found it hard to fight back these strong opinions. Actually, it wasn't that. I found it hard in a sort of practical, technical sense to be fair to both sides in the confines of a two-minute piece or worse, a one-minute live for the 10 o'clock news or for another program where... Afterwards, I would invariably think, gosh, did I give an extra few seconds or a little bit too much emphasis to that versus the other? I used to, as a, as a practical challenge, I found it difficult all the time, and I was constantly beating myself up on it. As an intellectual challenge, I actually found it very uh, satisfying because, as far as I was concerned, I mean, I'm not burdened with very sort of ardent ideological views that I was trying to fight back. And I always thought of it as a, a sort of intellectual exercise that you think of the strongest arguments that both sides has. So you're in a sense, you're presenting the best version of each side to give people a proper um, understanding of, of how the issue is viewed. I mean, your point about the politics, the underlying politics behind things, I mean, that's true. I suspect the political editor used to do a bit more of that because he was in a position to say, well, obviously, the politics behind this is X, Y, and Z. Um, I would do it a bit, uh, but you, I think what was more of a challenge was that if you're, if you're the senior economics person, you're considered to be adding some judgment based on your experience, and it was sometimes hard to see, you know, how you, you, need, you add a judgment which is to do with which arguments you choose and the kind of perspective you offer without actually giving a verdict, because it was different sort of a judgment and a verdict, and sometimes that was a, that was a gray area, and I found it quite challenging. I mean, just, you know, on this point, when I went to work, and, and Charlie mentioned that I'd been at the Financial Times and done these other things, when I went to television, a lot of my economist friends were quite sort of snobby about that and said, why would you want to go on television? And actually, you know, this is even, you know, before so many things were online and everything else, but I found it more intellectually challenging to say something that wasn't wrong, that was actually adding to knowledge in the 10 o'clock news than in the Financial Times. The Financial Times, you can just write it and people understand economics and you don't have to worry about whether it was really clear. That challenge of being clear and right was much greater on the 10 o'clock news. And I, you know, half the time I felt I was just either being banal or actually getting it slightly wrong in, in trying to simplify it. I think there was one up here, was there? 
Hmm? Hi, down here. <laughs> oh, right. It's okay, you yes. don't need to see me. Yes, um, I can see you. Uh, you, um, you talked about <laughs> politicians being constrained. Um, I presume that must be a systemic constraint. Um, do you find it worrying that a political system might give us good politics that isn't good economics? Well, I guess, I mean, as al it's always the case that you, sorry, repeating the question, do you worry, so the microphone doesn't go into the, all right. Um, uh, do I worry that good politics could give us bad economics? Well, it's obviously, um, history suggests that you can have lots of good politics that produces uh, bad economics. I think there's a particular thing now, which is when I talk about when I was sort of giving my uh, partial defense of politicians. I guess saying politicians aren't stupid is not the greatest defense of them, but at least it's, you know. But I think I was saying that because I think there is a, a, there's a very difficult thing that they're dealing with at the moment, sort of across particularly the Western economies, Europe, here. You're seeing it playing out uh, in the run-up to this election. You know, not making a political point, but I think... You know, the, the fact that the economy is delivering much you know, less satisfying outcomes to people, if you put it that way, I mean, it's not just that sort of living standards are being hammered, that people just feel like their horizons are being shrunk and their wealth is being squeezed and that what there is is being, div being divided less fairly. Um, I think all of that, a lot of that seems to be, you know, it's par parties all around the world are dealing with that regardless of what their policies have been. Um, and finding it very hard to come up with compelling political or economic stories. So I sort of feel, you know, I think you're right. I think, I think some, there could be some good politics that produces bad economics. I guess w what worries me is I can't see a lot of good economics coming out of the current scheme. I'm not seeing a lot of good answers from economists or anybody else. Of course, we had some of the answers in our winning essay about sector stagnation, but apart from that. Um, uh, hi. Um, how much longer do you think... Um, interest rates can be kept to a le record low? Oh, you should ask Charlie that, now he can answer. Um, I think it's going to be a lot longer than, we've, uh, than we would have imagined a few years ago. I mean, not to sort of get into the debate about whether, whether there'll be some small move this year in the US or the UK. Um, you know, we have a situation where mo the, the major central banks are all are all at record low interest rates, almost zero interest rates. We've never had that before in history. And as I say, even if we have very small rate rises this year, I think most, if you talk to most central bankers, even in the US or the UK, they don't at all rule out the possibility quite soon of having to cut rates again or do more quantitative easing, and then we have to explain it all again. Uh, we're at this. We're at an interesting time where, or in a, you know, this this very challenging time where it seems as though the world is just not ready to be weaned off this huge amount of stimulus. And in fact, the huge amount of stimulus of such low interest rates doesn't seem to be doing a lot of stimulating. It's doing some, but it's not uh, doing as much as as we would like, or seeming to sort of generate enough potential in the economy to, to be able to step back. So I think it could be much longer than we think. Um, until we find a way to start growing faster and using up some of these massive amounts of saving that's sloshing around the world. Which is very bad news for all of you, by the way, because it's not just... You know, people, do, my, when I was at the BBC, used to say we feel bad for pensioners and the fact that they're having to live on very low interest rates, because, and of course that was right, that they were suffering. But actually, Lord, uh, now Lord Mervyn King, used to say quite rightly, the people who really suffered are the people who were starting, who might have started to save for their pensions now. Because, you know, if you think about sort of the compounding effect, it's actually hurting your future pensions more than it's hurting people who've actually been saving for most of their lives at decent interest rates. Sorry about that. There was another one, uh, yes, I'm here. Just a couple. Um, what was the experience like at the BBC? And um, what did you get at A-level economics? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm really, I'm really glad I got an A, because that would be really embarrassing if I got an A, although I would think, but I got a C in Spanish, if that helps. Um, 
the, and I think I did, go, I did do the S level, but I, I only did, you'll be shocked to hear, I only did three A levels. I wonder whether, Charlie, how many do you do? Oh, four, oh dear. Um, well, I was a bit of a slacker, obviously, um, so I only did three. Um, so I just think, I mean, it's just a different world now. But yes, I was, I was really into economics. I was a sad person, at least in, in the, when I did A level. Um, I'm trying to remember what the other, it was like at the BBC. You know, I've talked a bit already about uh, what it was like. I mean, it's a fantastic institution. I mean, I think what was particularly, um, what was wonderful about the job that I had for the last five years of my time there, economics editor, is you know, the BBC is unique in its sort of dominance across, and lots of people think this is a bad thing, but being so dominant in news across lots of different outlets, so whether it's the website or radio or TV or World Service for that matter, there's no institution, I mean, if you, if you want sort of global domination on a media front, you know, it's a brilliant job to have the job I had before because if anything big happens, you can get people, you know, they may not want to turn the television on, but if they turn the computer on, then you're on the biggest news website. And if they turn the radio on, it's probably going to be your voice explaining what quantitative easing is. You could not escape me, at least, for the, on those big days. And there's something amazing about that, that you're being given, a, you know, even if you're not sort of megalomania about it, that you're being given the chance to explain that kind of stuff that you thought you just sort of learned about when you were doing A-level economics and then you carry on in life. Um, getting a chance to explain that to people, I really, um, you know, was an honor. I know it sounds really uh, sort of trite, but it's a great place to be. Yeah. I, uh, I have a question about um, economic forecasting in relation to um, your work, the work you're doing at JP Morgan now. Um, I was just wondering, in the position that you're in, are you seeing that there are um, quite promising developments in economic forecasting? For example, things like now casting techniques. Um, do you think that they will kind of pave the way for better forecasting? And, and aside from now casting techniques, are, is, there, is there anything else which has a lot of potential for the future? Ah. Uh, I should, well, so are there, other, are there things that have potential, other things that have potential for changing, I guess for changing economics or changing forecasting in the future? And in my current job at JP Morgan Asset Management, is, uh, do I see that sort of modern techniques like now casting are making forecasting better? I mean, I think forecasting in general, not so much JP Morgan, but the sort of now casting I think is helping. Um, and you can certainly maybe pick up turns a little bit better. I suspect we'll still never quite get over the problem of, you know, when do you, when do you say, well, this is just a sort of, you're still judging a turn. It's not just having the data, it's judging whether that is a, consistent turn or just a bump in the road and actually now casting doesn't necessarily help you with that because you're you're just going into a lower level of um, data so yeah I think it is I think it's getting better but I think the broader message that uh, that I would would have and I think you know most economists I respect have is that you know it's, it's actually been a bad thing for economics that we are so often associated and it's asked for forecasts because it really is it shouldn't be what forecasting is about, or it shouldn't be what economics is about. You know, it should be about seeing the world clearly and understanding stocks and flows and understanding what to look for in terms of sort of trends in the economy. But if, if we're gonna be measured by whether or not we get those growth forecasts better next time, then we're onto a losing wicket, I think. Any more, oh yes, here. I like women asking questions, girls asking questions. With regards to like your fourth um, point, which is politicians aren't stupid, um, I believe that as well because <laughs> they have like world world class um, educations. I was going to say, would you say that we have been like slower to recover from um, the recession because of the conflict in policies, so expansionary um, monetary policy and um, contractionary fiscal policy and other kind of austerity measures? Uh, well, I'm sure if you asked Charlie that question, he'd say they were not necessarily in conflict. They were complement. One was making possible, if you talk to George Osborne, you say one was making the other one easier to develop, develop in its fullness, it fullest extent. So at least the arguments in the before, beforehand in 2010, for a slightly faster path of tightening um, on the fiscal side was that it would allow the Bank of England the maximum room to respond. Um, 
Of course, the, you know, the arguments against that at the time were that this was a time where the Bank of England was sort of forced down this road of quantitative easing that was maybe less, might be less effective, was less well tested as a way of helping the economy, and maybe it was a time where you needed to still leave space for fiscal. You know, I think we, we sort of exaggerate the, the difference between what George Osborne did and what Labour was planning to do was not enormous. I think there's a mistake that was sort of generally accepted at that time, which if they'd done more, um, and a lot of people did say this at the time, and I had, a, you know, had conversations at the time around this, that investing more in public investment, not having the cuts that the, that the Labour, Labour had put in place um, for public investment would have been help, might have helped the economy at the margin. But you know, that's why I was saying, when you look, you, if you look around the world, there's a lot of places, even the US, that had more supportive fiscal policy in some ways, though not entirely, you know, has struggled to get out of this and has had much lower than usual growth. So I don't think it all comes down to you know, one particular set of mistakes. I think if, if we were going back now, we might not feel the same urgency that George Osborne felt and many others felt in 2010, but I don't think it would make uh, an enormous amount of difference. We'd still be looking at a slow recovery. Monetary rates um, haven't been, I would say that they're probably less efficient just because of the kind of outbalancing of um, the fiscal policies and austerity measures. So you wouldn't agree that maybe there's like an outbalance of You know, it comes measures. down to this question. So there's a question of whether or not um, monetary policy has been uh, dented or has, has been less effective than because of what was going on in fiscal policy or whether fiscal policy was making the, po making the stimulus uh, less effective. I mean, in a sort of, in an obvious kind of arithmetical way, the economy had demand taken out of it that would have still been there if you'd carried on borrowing. The question is, what price would you have paid for borrowing more? And the, the belief of many people, including the governor of the Bank of England in that, at that time, was that the UK was at risk of a debt crisis like Greece or Spain or some of these other places, because we did have by far the biggest budget deficit at that time. And if that had been the case, if we were at risk of that kind of crisis, then you needed, sense, you needed uh, tougher, at least some sense of sort of prudent fiscal policy to allow the Bank of England's policy to be effective. Remember, one of the ways it was explained in my really not very clear thing, but it was the best we could do on quantitative easing was it was supposed to bring down long-term interest rates, bring down the cost of borrowing for the government. Well, if people had started worrying about government debt and deficit in the UK and whether we'd be able to pay. Well, the first thing that would have happened is those borrowing rates would have gone up, regardless of what the Bank of England was doing. So that's what I mean when I said the argument was you needed to have credibility on the fiscal side for the central bank policy to work. In retrospect, it doesn't really feel like with power over our own currency, and indeed at the time it didn't, some people felt that it wasn't as pressing a worry uh, for us as it was for sort of Spain or Greece and that maybe there was room for maneuver on the fiscal side. You know, historians may judge that, but there was quite a debate at the time. It wasn't completely obvious. Uh, okay. I'd just like to expand on the point the gentleman made earlier about um, economics and politics being interlinked. Um, there have been lots of arguments that the, the sort of um, neoliberalistic policy has been used um, up t leading up to the crisis and the, the current policy is being used now so the, the more Keynesian ones have uh, political motives behind them. If we assume that economists won't exploit their position, do you think they'd be able to do the job better without close journalism, cl uh, close scrutiny from journalists? What would they be, oh, would, so would politicians do their job better? Uh, would economists do the job better if, if, the, if it wasn't for the political motives and if they weren't being scrutinized by journalists? Well, uh, so would, would economists do the forecasting and other things better if they weren't looking, um, looking at all this, having all this scrutiny? Well, I've already mentioned an example. I mean, making uh, the Office for Budget Responsibility an independent body that was responsible for the forecast in the UK ruled out sort of wishful thinking based on politics, doesn't rule out lots of other errors, and I don't think it ever was going to. And I thought it was a very clever thing to, to um, in a sense, to give responsibility for those mistakes to somebody else um, so that people weren't always... Uh, but I don't think... And I don't think that... The Office of Budget Responsibility would do any worse or any better because of political scrutiny. I'm not sure that it works. I think, if anything, 
as a journalist, I think transparency and the fact that the Office of Budget Responsibility is so transparent about every single element of its forecast, even more transparent than the Bank of England, in fact, about every single assumption it's based on, I think is really healthy because you've got all these other economists looking at it saying, well, is this right or is that right, and knowing exactly why the numbers come out. So I think in, in that sort of narrow sense, I don't think that people do their jobs better under scrutinized. Um, would, I think there's a more subtle point that politician, that Tony Blair made actually in a speech just before, I think, or just after, around the time he left. He gave a rather thoughtful speech about the media and how it affected the way politicians operate. And um, people inside the Bank of England have had maybe similar experience. It has become harder uh, to make policy um, in the way that was done in the past, you know, doing deals behind the scenes to save banks or um, the case of the Eurozone, it's much harder to think of them coming up with big schemes to write down debt and all of those things because they'd have to do it basically in a weekend without any journalist knowing and that's very unlikely to happen. So I can see that in certain cases, things that might be good for the world are harder because journalists are constantly um, able to report what's happening. But I think that those examples are quite small compared to the benefit you get of sunshine and transparency on policy making. Uh, often politicians get the blame for policies which simply aren't their fault, for example, monetary policies. Do you think that um, there is a public misunderstanding between uh, the distinction between politics and economics? And do you think that journalists have responsibility to uh, try and correct this? Well, I, I have to say, I, when it comes to sort of making sure people, other people get the blame for things, I think politicians can be left to do that on their own. They're quite good at um, doing that. Um, and it was often uh, made clear that the Bank of England was independent and uh, took its own steps. I guess it's more buried in your question, the sort of assumption that those were where the big mistakes were and that somehow um, in the, you know, the Bank of England was let off the hook for, for doing things. I mean, there is a, there's a sort of, there is a deeper question there about um, if you decide that economists can do these things better and maybe do it better without constantly having to get elected or having scrutiny of journalists, um, then you give the Bank of England or other sort of technocratic bodies more and more power. Um, and that can be a very good thing. But when they're, when they're doing things that are very politically momentous, it becomes a bit difficult. And it actually maybe makes it harder for them to act. I mean, I think the Bank of England actually was in quite a good position vis-a-vis -vis the Treasury. But it had, especially with regard to quantitative easing, there were quite clear rules about where the where the buck stopped and when it was the Bank of England that was deciding something and when it was actually the Treasury underpinning that. You know, who was actually going to pick up the tab if money was lost on buying these bonds? That quite clear relationship and the Chancellor, right, the Governor writing to the Chancellor when he gets things wrong, I thought was quite healthy because it sort of showed there was a connection with the politicians. The problem for the European Central Bank is that they didn't want any of that. They're absolutely independent. They get to pick their own inflation targets. They get to do their own thing. And you might think that's wonderful, they can't have political interference. Um, but it's met the, when, it, when they're being asked to do things that are actually very political, and some people say involve, you know, in, are in a sense bailing out governments, making it easier for governments to get away with things in the Eurozone or not, um, it's, I think, made it harder for them to act because they're not elected, because they don't have political authority. Um, so I think you're right that there's a sort of, uh, it, has, it has made life more complicated that you've got some independent bodies making very politically important decisions and we don't really know who to blame. Um, and I wonder in a few years' time, you know, how that will, how, who, how that will play out. Uh, hold on, I've got a question first that's come in from the internet. Oh. And it's actually come from last year's uh, RES lecturer, Tim Harford, oh. who says, Stephanie, what, ca what can we do to get more women into economics? <laughs> I'm, you can tell him I'm struggling to get more women to ask questions here, let alone anything else. Um, and yes, you should feel bad if you're not asking questions. Um, how do we get more women into economics? Well, have more women doing economics. I mean, I actually was, uh, I was lucky enough to get, I got an honorary um, degree uh, the year before last, at Leeds. And it was wonderful, actually. It was the day that the graduates were getting their degrees and there was a lot of women in this graduating class, and it was really nice to see. So I think a lot, 
a lot of women are going are learning economics, but it's like a lot it's like a lot of these stories. You start off with a lot of women, and then somehow it seems to get whittled away. And what we have to make sure is that economics is still interesting and vibrant um, to people, you know, five or five or ten years down the road. I mean, there is something else, which is there are lots of. I mean, we we tend to find that the what many people would say is the proper bits of economics that are actually a bit more rigorous, the microeconomics, um, does attract more women. And maybe it's just that women are more sensible and they don't go into these bits of macro. I mean, macroeconomics, in many ways, it's been a, it's been a difficult few years for, for macroeconomics because in some ways it wasn't really ready for the prime time that it's got. You know, everyone's focusing on macroeconomics for the answer. And the areas where people are looking for answers is where macro, macroeconomics has always really fallen short. So it's been a difficult been a difficult time. No wonder sensible women don't want to get involved. <laughs> Doesn't mean you can't ask questions, though. No? Um, hello. Right. Um, thank you for the talk, by the way. Um, <laughs> um, returning to your presentation, you mentioned um, uh, that over across the last three decades, uh, the UK, despite um, various booms and busts given the different parties that... Uh, the UK has maintained a, a steady growth rate of about 2% or so. And yet you said that uh, during the recession, uh, it lost about 15% uh, in terms of potential growth. Um, you alluded to that being permanent for some kind of fundamental reason. Um, is that a personal belief? And if so, do you have a theory behind it? No, I think it's, I mean, it's a, so it's just a question of uh, talking about how far we've gone below our long-term trend and whether that was whether, I w whether it was a belief that we'd lost all of this potential that we'd grown so slowly. I mean, I think it was, it was slightly different. I mean, it, it is a fact that, and, and you won't disagree with this, but it, it, it is a fact that we've, we're now that far. We're 15% smaller, our economy, than we would be if we'd got back to that trend. It's not that we've had a steady growth rate, but it's just we've always managed to get back to that. We've caught up uh, from recessions. Um, as I said, I think, I hesitate to say it's permanent. Um, certainly most people think we can get a bit of it back, and the Bank of England sort of testing how much potential we can get, how much is there, how much spare capacity there is in the economy. We're going to test it this year by keeping, you know, continuing to have rates very low, even if rates, uh, interest rates go up a little bit. But as I was saying, I think it's more... It's such a large number, it's very hard to believe that we've got sort of, you know, 15% of our economy just sort of hidden behind the fridge or something, that it's just going to be there ready to have back. And if you see it, if you see the same kind of shortfall, maybe a bit smaller, in so many other countries, it does make you wonder whether something more fundamental has happened, that we just, whether it's demand side or supply side, and that is precisely, I mean, the winning essay was about it, but it's something that we're, at, in JP Morgan, you know, in the international finance world, in the policy world, in you know, economics lessons up and down the country and around the world, this is what people are talking about, is how much of this is permanent? What is driving this shortfall in demand? Is my old boss, Larry Summers, right that this is you know, secular stagnation, that we've got a de chronic demand deficiency? If he is right, what can we do about it? You know, this is the time to be thinking and learning about this stuff. I've said for quite a while now, I thought it was a fantastic time to learn about economics, even though it was a quite painful time to be an economist, but uh, you've, just had, you've been able to learn about it when it's actually exciting and asking all these <laughs> fundamental questions. All right. Um, so uh, you've been a journalist for a long time of your career. So you've probably done articles or like reports on J.P. Morgan as well before you worked at J.P. Morgan. I didn't. I never you have. Never. <laughs> oh, then how, how does it feel? <laughs> no, no, it's a serious point because I didn't ever do business economic. I didn't do business reporting. So there was a little rule between me and Robert Peston that he broke all the time, actually. But his, historically, historically, the business editor has done stories with a capital with proper names. So the pro the name of a company or a business, and the economics editor does sort of general economics. So uh, thankfully, I had never written anything about J.P. Morgan, but. How does it um, feel to work at the biggest bank in the world as a formal journalist? Well, you still write um, articles, but how does it feel like, like you're now inside the industry, you know more in information about it. Uh, do you still keep your ethics as a journalist? <laughs> 
Um, you assume I had ethics as a journalist to begin with. Um, <laughs> You know, it's a really good question. Um, you know, it's sort of a joke that people say to me, oh, you've gone to the dark side. I mean, the, you know, banking is, you know, journalism is pretty unpopular. Politicians are pretty unpopular. Bankers, I think, are now well below, below that. Uh, you know, for me, it, it was, it's, it's funny. A few years ago, JP Morgan was the institution that had come out of the financial crisis looking the strongest. It was the least um, close to serious problems of solvency or anything of any of the major banks uh, during the financial crisis. It was considered to be a model in some ways of they had a much stronger balance sheet going in and all of that stuff. It's been tarnished somewhat by all these sort of uh, big fines and things that have happened over the last few years, quite often, at least the major ones actually related to companies they bought to help uh, stem the crisis at the time. So it's, you, know, you can argue both ways on that one. I don't think it's, uh, of course, I wouldn't have taken the job if I thought I was going to be sort of leaving my ethics at the door. I mean, it's amazing to me the effort that's going on inside all the major financial institutions to try and rewin people's trust. And, you know, I will see it from the inside and maybe, if, you know, at some point I'll report back on whether I think they've really changed the culture relative to what it was before. But they've, there is a genuine effort underway because people, whatever the rights and wrongs and, who, you know, whatever happened before the crisis, People, people inside, I can tell you, realize uh, that they've lost a lot of uh, credibility with the outside world, and we spend a lot of time thinking about how to rebuild it. I would also say, just from a more practical standpoint, as someone who wants to understand the world, understand that's why I wanted to work for government in the US, seeing how policy is made rather than just having conspiracy theories about it was really helpful, and the same thing applies inside a bank. It's given me a whole different, you know, we, you sit around often thinking, well, we should you know, you should have this policy or that policy, capital regulations, this, that, and the other for banks. When you see how these things are actually implemented and what, the, how they affect the business in different ways, it gives you a very different um, perspective. So I just think just to, just to be well informed, you should work, you know, to have an interesting life and to be well informed about life, you should work in lots of different places. I recommend it to everybody. Am I allowed to go to you uh, now? Hi. No? No? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it it's so hard to see where people are coming from. There is a woman here, yeah. But wasn't there another question? No? Okay, here. Um, well, have you, being a woman in this industry, have you ever found it belittling in like what is perceived to be a male orientated industry? No, the opposite. I mean, I think, uh, and I, this is another reason, just out of pure self interest, I encourage you to go into the, a world that's dominated by men. Um, because I think we're in a world where, you know, people are trying to make sure that more women come through. So I feel I've almost always benefited from being a woman. Um, you know, I like to think that I got these, you know, got various jobs on my merits, but I don't think it ever hurt that I was a woman. And I, I still feel that. And now in business, you know, there's a great desire to get women in. My old boss, Larry Summers, although he's had sort of a checkered history on saying things about women, the thing he used to say when I worked for him at the Treasury, his key staff, his closest staff were three women. Um, and it was quite empowering that you know we were we were all together you know clever women working with him and helping him, but he said sort of semi jokingly, but I think also with the sort of mind of an economist, he used to say that he would you know he preferred he would sort of choose to hire women because you could get in a in a discriminating world you get a higher value of women for the same price, um, which if, you know as economists you would all agree with that if that's you know, if there is an economics of discrimination, that's obviously right. Is it me now? Or I wouldn't recommend offering yourself <laughs> as a lower price. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think you should be the same price, obviously, but as long as we live in a biased world. <coughs> All right, and then we are going to have to finish, I think. Yeah, okay. All right, hi there. Um, I was just wondering, do you think the UK could survive economically in the EU? In the EU? Yeah. Um, I think it's difficult. It's funny because I, um, as an economist, for some of the reasons that I mentioned earlier, I was always against Britain going into the euro. Um, I've... I'm, what I'm going to say is sort of a little bit flippant, but actually not entirely flippant. I've changed my view somewhat because I think that if we had joined, we would at least have performed the world a very valuable service of blowing up the Eurozone. 
we would have, and I say it is sort of semi-serious. I actually think that as, as carried out, the Eurozone was something that institutionally was going to really struggle for a very long time, and it just took a while for that to be clear. The fact that you had such a wide range of countries joining. With that wide range of countries and the rules that they put in place that, as I said, were rather kind of illogical in some ways or denying of, of reality, um, it was always going to be a really problematic enterprise that had the potential to cause a lot of damage, not just to the European countries that were in it, but everybody else. And if we had gone in it, we would in inevitably have had a terrible time in this crisis, and we would inevitably, I think, have left. And the fact that we had left would have caused a horrible crisis for us, um, but it would have set an example to others, and others would have left, and you would have ended up with either no Eurozone or a much smaller Eurozone that actually caused, was more, less challenging for the rest of the world. So, you know, having said that, which as I say is kind of semi, somewhat flippant, but actually also a sort of real point that I think there were fundamental problems with it from the beginning. I think we've now, because it has, it continues to exist and is going to have to find a way to integrate and find a way to um, make it work, we've been presented with two, we're now presented with two quite difficult options neither of which are particularly great. And that's you know, staying in the EU and getting the economic benefits that come with that and the very important uh, linkages and single market and everything else that comes with that, but in a way that will, make, will become more and more politically difficult. And that will, will it be possible actually to be in the U European Union but not in the Eurozone? I think that's going to become very difficult. Or being out which is also going to be very difficult and be very damaging for our economy in other ways and hard for our politics. So um, I don't know the answer, but I think it's, a much, it's much harder to predict now than it was a few years ago. And, basic, and neither option really looks very appealing, which is going to make it difficult to, to sell when it comes to making a vote. The kind of things that I wouldn't have talked about when I was having to be very balanced at the BBC. Um, was there one final question? I don't know where it was. Oh, yeah. Actually, following on from that question. Yeah. Uh, so how significant, sorry, uh, <laughs> how significant is the role of a journalist in these economic decisions such as UK's membership of the EU? Well, it's, it's interesting because I think, obviously, when I, was, when I was doing the job, you're sort of torn. When you do it badly, you like to think that everybody forgets what you say, and it's a bit like the journalistic equivalent. People say it's fish paper, you know, that you just what, what you write is going to get used as fish paper the next day. Um, things seem to stick around forever now on, online, so you can't say that anymore. But, um, or you know, having that view, or having the view that everything, every word you said was very important. I suspect it's both. But I'm, I'm not unhappy, let's put it this way. I, I'm glad I'm not the person who has to give a really balanced view of these issues around Europe. And again, not because I feel strongly about it, but because I think the economics is inherently really hard and you know, whether it's a Scottish referendum or a future referendum in Europe, you know, in either case, there is no, there's no honest answer when people say, well, what are, the pros, what are the pros and cons of, or the economic pros and cons of leaving or staying in? You cannot know really what the economic pros and cons are until after you've seen, after you've had the vote and you see what the deal is or the, you know, the world looks like after a vote. And you can really only get a glimpse of what that world's going to look like beforehand because the incentives beforehand are for people to say it's going to be very bad or really good, but you don't really know the true picture. So I think in principle it's very important for journalists to be playing this role and talking about the pros and cons. In practice, it's fraught with uncertainty and extremely difficult, and you just have to try and get as wide a range of views as you can, as you do in life to avoid groupthink. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. Um, your top point says being clear is just as important as being right. You've been both clear and right tonight. Um, I think it's been, uh, as I say, a, a, a tour de force. I'm sure everybody here uh, has enjoyed the lecture. Um, can I um, uh, repeat what was said 
the outset by Amanda to invite you all uh, to the reception afterwards. Uh, and once again, thank you very much, Stephanie.